I have a background as a, I'm a journalist, and I have a background writing about uh, business. And I started covering for a job. My job was to cover the food industry. This is about 10 years ago. And pretty soon, um, I started to, to look at uh, our food choices differently when I started covering um, the business of food. And I, went in, I would go into the grocery store, and, and I would start to wonder, what are all these products that people are eating? I mean, there's so many products in the grocery store. The average grocery store has 43,000 different products. And I'd look at the labels, and I'd wonder, what are all these ingredients? Where are they coming from? Who's putting all of these, these foods together? And same at fast food restaurants. I'd look, I'd go on the website, and you have to click around for, for quite a while sometimes to find the ingredients. And I would look at the ingredients and wonder what these things were. So I started becoming really curious about food and about what it is that we're all eating. Um, and since I was covering the food industry, I, I started asking questions and I started talking to food companies and I started talking to food scientists. I didn't really realize that there were people that um, had careers as food scientists. I didn't know what food scientists did. And when I started talking to these people and I started going to trade shows and industry events, a whole world opened up, um, a whole world of incredible um, technological innovation that's been applied to food, um, things that happen to our food after it leaves the farm, what happens inside the factories in the food industry, and I was, um, I was amazed but I was also appalled at the level of technological complexity that was going into our food. And, in, and at the time, this is about 10 years ago, it was a story, it was really an untold story. Um, people had no idea um, what was happening to their food and what was going into food, and it was something that I really felt was important to um, for me to write about it, and I did it a little bit at the time in my job, but mostly I filed a lot of it away um, for later to write about it in a book, and that's the book that I ended up writing, Pandora's Lunchbox. I hope it's going to open their eyes to um, the reality of our broken food system, to the reality that the, a lot of the food that we're eating is not actually food. It can't be called food because it doesn't have the essential nourishment that, that food has to have, the nourishment that comes from um, farms, it comes from the soil and sunlight um, and water, and um, it really doesn't deserve to be called food. We're eating these things that are edible, they've been, they're essentially engineered food products that are sold as food and, and marketed as food, but they're, they're not food. And I hope that uh, maybe in reading the book people, people might start to open their eyes and um, just start to think a little bit more skeptically about how much of their food they want to outsource to the big food companies. Um, and is that really something um, that's serving them, their health, um, and their kids' health? Or do we need to take some of that back um, into our home, home kitchens and start doing more of our meal preparation and, and not trusting the big food companies who don't have, um, and this isn't a statement about the evil, um, the evil nature of, of the people that work at food companies, because they're not, but they're, they don't have, the, in, their interest is not in our health. Their interest is not in public health, it's not in our individual health, their interest is in, is in making money. And it's just a very, very different agenda and it's a really important thing to realize about, about these big companies whose products we've been eating for years and years and years. I think the time is right for um, information about the food that we eat and about our food system and how our food is, is produced because for too long people have been in the dark and they they haven't known about what happens on, on farms with animal agriculture, and then they, they certainly haven't known what happens inside these humongous factories of the, of the food industry. And people want to know, they deserve to know. People deserve to know um, what's in their food, how it's made, what, what goes on behind the scenes. And there's a lot of interest in that. People have a ton of interest. So most of the response that I've gotten has been very positive. Sometimes it scares people, which is, is not my goal, um, to scare people. Um, and it's not to necessarily make people um, entirely clear out their pantries, but maybe look skeptically at it and think about buying different things when they go to the grocery store. Um, I just think that a little bit of information can, can go a long way, and the good news is that, that people are seeking out that information. And it's, I think it's the compilation of so many things, it's the, so many documentaries that have been done, um, so many um, organizations, NGOs, and, and um, groups have been working um, to get information out there to people. And um, there's a long way to go, though. You know, there's, there's a lot of people whose eyes are open, but a lot of people, um, I think a lot of people are, are being missed. And one of my regrets with, um, with writing this book and um, 
um, doing publicity on it and doing talks is there are certain areas of the country where I've never been asked to speak, never been asked to do an interview. I think there's entire pockets of the country that are, are not aware um, that if maybe the, certainly have not read any of Michael Pollan's books, probably maybe don't even know who Michael Pollan is, really aren't aware of these issues um, and are probably consuming diets that are really heavily loaded in processed food and suffering as a result. And I honestly don't know how to reach those people. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's the next frontier of the food movement where I think it's where, people, where we have to go and figure out how to reach those people that are not seeking out the message. No, there's a lot of places that I, you know, because when I first did the book, you, you do a ton of um, media and press and especially a lot of radio interviews. And um, I mean, I didn't do one in the South. Not one. Midwest, there were some in the Midwest, certainly on the coast but uh, not in the South at all. So that's the biggest area. And those, that's the area of the country where there's the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. I, Michelle and I differ on this point, um, the role of, of education. I think that reaching kids, um, especially at the younger ages, in elementary school and middle school, um, before they start to think that they know it all, you know, when they're actually open to new information and they want to learn and they're curious about things, reaching kids to educate them about about food, where food comes from, and how to do basic, simple cooking um, in the kitchen so that they become familiar with it and they start to understand that what they're eating at fast food or what their friends are eating at fast food and what comes to them at birthday parties um, and the, the stuff that they're constantly exposed to everywhere in stores everywhere and, and on television is not actually food, right? It's a certain kind of food or what we call food but there's a whole other dimension to what humans have eaten for, for since the beginning of time. And that has to happen, that education has to happen um, in the kitchen. So I think it's, you know, there's interesting things going on in the UK where they're, they've actually brought that into schools. They found the funding and they brought basic cooking classes into the schools. Um, it's an incredibly important initiative. I would love to see it happen here. I know that there's huge barriers to doing it, but I think we need to start figuring out a way to do that and figuring out a way to educate our kids, um, to teach them from an early age um, what food really is and what, what nourishment is, and to make it fun. You know, you don't complicate it, you don't do elaborate cooking classes, and you don't beat them up about, um, you know, like the, the food pyramid or anything like that. You just, you make it fun, and you, you have um, gardens, like our school where our kids go is a public school, there's a garden, um, and the kids plant the, um, uh, all the vegetables and then they pick them. It's just a really important thing for an education for kids to have and I think if we start taking that approach with our children um, it, will ha it will have a huge payoff down the road because suddenly you have a whole generation of kids or a significant portion of a generation of kids that thinks very differently about food than the previous generation did. So I think we, yeah, I think it has to start with kids. I think that's that's a really important aspect to education. And I, I don't think we've really tried that. Um, we haven't really focused on that. I mean, there's some efforts, you know, there's some areas where there's school food is being reformed, and, and that's a great thing. But that, that only reaches a certain population of, um, of kids. So, and they're not, you know, they're eating better food, but they're not, they're not really learning about how to cook it, or where it comes from, and how it grows, and all that. So, and then when, you know, when I was doing research for the book, there's this great organization that teaches cooking classes to um, adults. They do some for kids, but it's mostly for adults. It's for low-income adults. And they teach them how to cook simple meals, um, really inexpensive. It's $10 for a family of four. Um, simple recipes, but very healthy recipes. And then they give them the, um, the ingredients to make it at home. It's called Cooking Matters. It's available in most states. There's, I think there's a few states where they don't have it. Um, that's just one example of a really wonderful program uh, that can open people's minds to um, um, to a different way of thinking about food and just a, a practical approach about how to eat how to eat better and giving them the nudge that they they might need to um, to start doing a little bit more cooking and, and improve their their health and their lifestyle. I just felt like there was an untold story. I mean, as a journalist, that's what we that's what we look for. We we look for things that we're curious about and we look for untold stories especially stories that are important, that people need to know, um, that they'll find important. In this case, it was something that was important for people's health to know and to understand 
um, what it is we're eating. I mean, the, the average American is 70% uh, of, of the average American's calories are coming from processed food. So this is not, this is not a small contribution. I mean, that's the things that we buy at the grocery store and at fast food restaurants. So this is a major part of our diet. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the havoc that it's wreaking on our health is very, is very obvious and, and becoming more obvious every, every day. And so I think it's, it just felt to me like a, um, just a very, um, a very important hidden story that needed to be brought to light. Yeah. They're all coming from, most of them are coming from four commodity crops. Um, most of the ingredients in processed food, if you look at the label and you understand a little bit about how these ingredients are made, um, most of them come from corn, wheat, soy, and milk. Um, and those four commodity crops are broken down in a, in a variety of ways and turns into, turned into all kinds of different um, powders and syrups and things that are reassembled back into processed food. I mean, that's essentially the model of the, the processed food industry, how they, how they make their foods. Oh, no, I mean, it's just the, those are the crops that um, farmers have gravitated towards that are, that are cheap. I mean, um, it's just those are the soybeans, corn, we grow a ton of them, um, dairy, you know, and milk. Um, there's obviously a ton of that, and then wheat. And, and there are just the crops that, that food scientists use to create all kinds of um, different food ingredients that can be used in a whole variety of ways to, to assemble into something that a marketing person calls a toaster strudel uh, or any number of other things, um, thousands of other things in a supermarket. Well, I think the hope is that when the child grows up, they will seek out information for themselves. You know, you, you hope that. There's certainly lots of information out there if someone wants to seek that out. It's just, where does that motivation come from? You know, and, and maybe down the road, um, a child that does have a, a poor diet and is it maybe is facing some health issues later on because of that, maybe when they're in their 20s, someone that nudges them in the right direction or they just, they just start reading or watching or um, doing web surfing on their own. And, and there's certainly a lot to open up people's eyes. So people can always, you know, people can always change. It's not easy to change your diet, but people do it. Um, and the payoff for doing so is immense. And it's not like, you know, decades down the road, like I'm going to live longer, you know, and when I'm 70, I won't be as sick. It's it's pretty soon, you know. Within sometimes within a couple of weeks, I talk to people who had cut out processed food or dramatically reduced it and changed their diet. Um, I talked to them when I was doing research on my book, and they all said that. Within a few weeks, um, the energy that they felt throughout the day, they didn't have sugar crashes in the afternoon where they had to like get something sh a sugary thing to, to eat. Um, in the morning, they, their head wasn't as clogged. And, um, it makes an can make an immediate difference in your health, just changing what you eat, especially if you're cutting out sugar and, um, and white flour and things like that. You know, most of the food that Americans are eating is, is not food. It's not food that was grown. It's food that was made by food scientists and, and engineers, and it's re-engineered back into something that the food industry decides to market as food, but it's not actually food. And so if people read my book, I think that that becomes apparent, and, and I think you start to look at food differently, and you start to differentiate, and you start to look for things that have a connection to a farm, that look like they were grown on a farm, and that were not engineered together by food scientists.